Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for who you are and all that you're doing in our lives. I know that there's a lot of people, your people, today that are hurting and going through circumstances that are difficult to understand or comprehend. I just ask that you would uh, bless them in a special way, that you would provide all their needs, but most importantly, give them the understanding that you are meeting all of their needs spiritually in Christ, that they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. It is so wonderful that you've given us the privilege to study together, to feast together upon your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. Filter out all that which is ignorant and foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Revelation. Uh, verse by verse in some cases, uh, chapter by chapter in other cases, or section by section. An amazing revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, uh, I think it's worthy to point out that it's not a history uh, book and though it is prophecy about it very much speaks about things to come it is first and foremost primarily first and foremost it is a revelation of Christ it reveals Christ and I, I guess I, I find it quite uh, it's not surprising, but I find it uh, quite interesting how that in all of Scripture that we see any time we look at anything that has anything to do with uh, God's people in conflict with, you know, uh, the conflict between the two seeds, uh, Isaac and Ishmael which has raged on all down uh, through history and it has which has manifested itself in in multiple ways that Christ always we always see Christ as v victorious obviously and we see the message the underlying message that his people are also victorious as well and I doubt that any one of us would dare suggest, at least uh, while in our right mind, that God's people are ever victorious because uh, of their own strength, that they overcame, that they uh, conquered, and they became victorious on their own, apart from God. And I, I guess that's what I find so disheartening, is that we live in an age today in which Christianity as a whole, you know, taken collectively, you know, for the most part, the system of, of belief, of Christian uh, Christendom, the world uh, religious system, that I've, I've often referred to as one which is based on human merit, doesn't see that message at all. I mean, it, it might claim to, but, but when, when, when it's pushed into a corner, it, it will defend tooth and nail the fact that uh, God's really not sovereign. Uh, over our lives and, and he's left it open for us to, to either become victorious or not. Then maybe we will and maybe we won't. And you know, of course we know, you know, we know the story. The good Christians, you know, they they become victorious and 
and the, the bad Christians, they don't. I've never seen that in 30 years of study. So I wanted to preface this with that, uh, just a, a sort of somewhat of a quick review. You know, when we crossed over into chapter 16, we were at the end of the tribulation period, the, the time of uh, Jacob's trouble, the da Daniel's 70th week. We're at the end of the tribulation period where that the, uh, the, the seven bold judgments occur. Uh, this is before our Lord's return, the second coming, the church already being in heaven. At least that's the position of this ministry. And then we, we went over into chapter 17 and we looked at the woman on the beast, uh, the uh, mystery of the, the great harlot, the mystery Babylon. And, and we looked at that and, and we saw the, uh, how that the... Uh, the lamb was uh, victorious. And in chapter 18, we, we looked at Babylon had being, ha having been fallen and how that they lamented over Babylon having fell and the uh, rejoicing of the saints in heaven. And we went over into chapter 19 where we saw more rejoicing in heaven and a mention of the marriage of the Lamb. And I explained that uh, at least the position of this ministry, that the marriage must occur sometime between the rapture and the second coming. And that this looks forward to a marriage banquet, a marriage feast, a marriage supper which I believe is a parabolic picture of the entire thousand year reign of Christ, where that Christ will then, after he returns at the second coming, he will introduce his bride, the church, to his friends, Israel. And then we started looking at the, uh, in chapter 19, the rider on the white horse. And whether you want to compare that to or relate that to, call that the same rider on the white horse that we saw in the, the beginning of the opening of the seven seals, uh, whether that's, if you want to take that as the Antichrist uh, coming upon the scene, uh, uh, revealing himself, uh, going about to make war, uh, but he has a bow in, you know, in his hand. Uh, he, but he arrives in, in a deceitful way and, and he uh, deceives the nations. He's, he presents himself as a man of peace. Or whether you want to take that as Christ, we're, we're coming up on a passage uh, concerning another rider on a white horse in chapter 20. But we saw in chapter 19, we saw that he does return. And he, this is at the end of the tribulation period, so he returns to establish his kingdom on earth, a literal thousand year millennial kingdom, the reign of Christ on earth. And we, we saw that the false, the prophet, the, the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet are defeated during this war and this is a war and there's been a lot of confusion I believe uh, concerning uh, that word Armageddon and uh, sometimes people will talk about uh, Armageddon and they'll, they'll mention the you know Gog and Magog and they combine the two and they look at the two as synonymous and the two are not at the return of Christ, when he defeats his en enemies, this is the battle of, of Armageddon. The Gog and Magog war, if you want to call it a war, which uh, I'll, I might talk a little bit more about that, but this is at the end of the thousand years. This is after Satan's been bound for a thousand years and he's loosed 
to go about deceiving the nations. There is a, a, a one last ditch effort on the part of Satan to uh, avoid the inevitable, which is eternal judgment, to overthrow Christ. This is Gog and Magog. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about those, those two names, Gog and Magog. I think there's also been some confusion uh, when it comes to uh, the, the mention of those two names. The identity of Gog and Magog. So, the uh, Antichrist and false prophet, they were both cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. And I want you to take note of the fact that this lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels, and yet Satan is not yet there. The, the, the first individuals, I believe the lake of fire right now is empty, and the, the first two individuals to be cast into this lake of fire and is the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they're cast into it alive. This is at the second coming. And of course, for the thousand year reign to, uh, of Christ on earth, the kingdom to proceed, Satan must be bound for a thousand years in the abyss. That's not the lake of fire. So now that takes us into chapter 20. Where John says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And we've got four names mentioned. Seems to me like the Holy Spirit wants to make sure that the reader understands who this is. And he's bound bound for a thousand years he's cast into the bottomless pit and he sh and shut him up and, a s and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season clearly we can see who's got the upper hand here Satan is not allowed to do anything, anything, never has been, unless it's been under God's direction and control. And I saw thrones, and, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. These are those in the tribulation period. It could very well be all of those who were ever beheaded at any time. But the context is the tribulation period. And for the word of God, and, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. If these live and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and they are raised at the second coming of Christ. But the rest of the dead, listen, the rest of the dead, those who were not in Christ, those who died during this period of tribulation, who were in Adam, lost souls, non-elect, unbelievers, whatever title you want to give them, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. We are said to be uh, co-reigners, co-heirs, will we'll 
rule and reign with Christ, as well as the tribulation saints will rule and reign with Christ for and most scholars believe that extends on past the thousand years into it forever. Okay, we'll rule and reign with him forever. And it's when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, which were in the four quarters of the earth. It's hard not to see that as northeast, south, and west because the earth isn't a flat grid, despite what many people might want you to believe. Gog and Magog, and here we have the first mention of Gog and Magog. And of course, everybody knows that's Russia kind of reminds me uh, without getting into the political you know scene so without I try very hard to avoid the political discussion you know of things but it it, it just I find it a little humorous that everything nowadays is you know as far as one political party here in the United States it's all about it's Russia 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 and in the same sense very real sense uh anytime in gog and magog is mentioned everybody every seems like every christian alive knows that's russia that's russia 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 i'm going to suggest it's not russia uh, oh steve yeah we know that and you've made videos on this before and uh, we know that your position is it's uh, north of israel and so you're we're, we're looking at turkey okay Turkey is Gog and Magog. And I'm going to suggest that that's not true either. Uh, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And you can say, well, that's a, that's a lot of people. And there will be many people alive during this time, this period. Uh, or will there be? That's the question. It's been massive death during this tribulation period. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. That's everywhere. And they compassed the camp of the saints about. That's everywhere where there's saints. I don't know whether it's Japan, China, Australia, New Zealand, you name it, Mexico, Latin America, South America, Canada, up north, Alaska, you know, uh, no, it's everywhere. Everywhere there's God's people. And the beloved city, we've got a conjunction and the beloved city, which we know is Jerusalem. So you're looking at Magog, Gog and Magog, which I'll go ahead and tell you, I believe, represents all of God's enemies. It's a figurative language. I know there was a literal Gog and Magog, but the, and the, but the Jews recognized this as figurative of all of God's enemies everywhere, no matter what. The, the time, the age. Okay. I believe the text is using the name Gog and Magog to describe not one particular nation of people, but the wider, the broader description of all the enemies of God. All. To gather them together to battle. Now, the word battle, okay, that's Satan's intention. Okay. Uh, it is Satan in the context here who is loosed, who will go out to deceive the nations which were in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. That's the purpose. That's his intention. The number 
of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints about, and they went up on the breadth of the earth. That's, that's everywhere. And the beloved city, and fire came down, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Stop. Here we have Christ ruling and reigning, God of very God, God in human flesh, the man God, Jesus Christ, the one, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who destroyed the Antichrist with the, the word of his mouth, okay? And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Couldn't, couldn't Christ have easily handled this is basically what I'm driving at here. But the text doesn't say that. There's something different going on here. Okay? Something extraordinarily different going on here than what went on when Christ returned and defeated all his enemies at the Battle of Armageddon. As I mentioned, he, he's seen coming out of Elam with uh, his garments uh, dipped in the blood of his enemies. Uh, Southern Jordan, uh, actually, you know, Ezekiel, Isaiah, you'll read, you know, his garments are stained with the blood of his enemies. Uh, if you look on a modern day map, this is all Middle Eastern. Uh, we see Jordan, we see uh, Syria, we see Iran, we see Saudi Arabia, all, much, all of these border nations and all of these outlying nations, these outer ring of nations are all involved in this, in this one last great conflict of the ages. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Now he's cast into the lake of fire. This is, this is when the thousand years are expired. Now it doesn't say right on date on the, the 1,000th year day calendar, right on the day. It doesn't say that. It just say, it says after the thousand years are expired. Could be some, some gap, some time interval, some lapse of time that takes place between this. But the thousand years must expire. And then at some point, this occurs. So they're cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And in verse 11 of chapter 20, we begin reading about this final judgment. And I saw, John says, the great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. It's interesting. The earth and the heaven fled away. It's not that this took place. God and this great white throne fled away from earth and heaven. It's, you know, they it, it, this occurred someplace far away from heaven and earth, the heavens and the earth. It's the heaven and the earth fled away. And there was no, there was found no place for them. In other words, there's no more purpose. No more purpose for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened. And uh, it's, I believe very easy or tempting or simple uh, and common, I think, for most Bible students, I think, when they read that, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, okay? Uh, well, this is, they're, they're raised. They're raised at the end of the thousand years. It said, the text said that they're, the, the rest of the dead did not live until the end of the, the thousand years. 
did not live again. And uh, so this is the second death. This is being the twice dead in Jude that we've talked about. He, uh, died once in Adam. Uh, never were born again. Uh, when the law came in, sin revived and I died. So we died in our own sins. I've spent some time talking about how that no no one will ever st be able to, to rightly stand before God and say, well, why did you send me to hell because of something that Adam did? And that's because the atonement was sufficient for all men. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said. Not part of the world. He didn't say, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of His people only. God's demand for justice had to be satisfied as it regards the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, that payment that had to be made, that debt had to be paid concerning all men for the Father to be propitiated, okay? This is why babies born don't go to hell. A, a three-month-old infant is not going to wind up in the lake of fire who dies of crib death. Why? Because Christ paid for that baby's sins. But at some point in their life, the law comes in. Now, many people say, well, that's the age of accountability. It's, and that's 12 years old. We're 12, you know, we just pick a number. You know, we got to have a number. So we pick a number. It's 12 or 21. Maybe it's 18, 21. I don't know. It's when you're able to drive, you know, but it's, it's, it's uh, at some point you're an adult. And so God's looking out for your birthday. And, and, and so the text the only, only states that it's when the law comes in, sin revives and I died. It's when the person comes to understand the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil, okay? And that can be different in, in the case of, of each individual, in, in each individual's case. We don't know. We're not told. We can only guess at when that might be. But the law comes in, sin revives, and now I die. I die in my own sins. Now, now I can't blame Adam. Okay, I can't say, well, Lord, why, you know, uh, or God, why are you, you know, why, do, why am I standing before you at this great white throne judgment uh, condemned forever for all eternity to be separated from you for all eternity for something that I didn't even have anything to do with. I didn't have anything to do with what I, wasn't my fault Adam sinned. No person will ever wind up in the lake of fire because of what Adam did. Okay? You die in your own sins, and then at some point, if you're one of God's elect, one of the seed that he sowed, one that was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, one that was given to the Son as a gift by the Father, no man can come unto me unless it be given of, granted him by the Father. Then that new birth, okay, you're now alive in Christ, and there is no second death. Oh, there was a second death. You died in Adam. You died in your own sins. But the new birth canceled out. You haven't died in your own sins. Because Christ died in your place. He paid the penalty for that sin. So now you stand before God, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. God has nothing against you. Despite how you feel like you've lived your life, or how you don't live your life, in Christ, you stand before God, holy, 
unblameable and unreprovable in his sight because of what Christ did, not because of what you did. And no saint, tribulation saint, is ever presented in the book of Revelation in some picture as, as if they somehow overcame on their own, in their own strength. Now, without getting off onto a, this a long rabbit trail away from our present study into just an area of which I typ typically feel more comfortable in, which is just preaching. To get back to the text, we're looking at, quite simply, on the surface at least, we're looking at a, a time in which Christ returns at the second coming. The tribulation period is complete. God's judgment upon his nation, Israel, and the Gentiles, those who have made this earth their permanent abode, that time has been fulfilled. It's complete. There's nothing else. No more judgment. Judgment is complete. And Christ returns to establish his kingdom, defeats his enemies, this is where the nations are judged. The nations themselves, collectively, corporately, collectively as a whole, the nations are judged. The individuals are judged. Sheep and goats, the separation of the sheep and goats. There will be those who enter into the kingdom, who survived that period, They'll enter into it alive to, to help populate the kingdom. There will be those who will not. They will be removed by angels, elect, holy elect angels. They'll be removed and not allowed to enter into the kingdom. And this all refers back to, and I mentioned this before, what many misunderstand about the parable of the ten virgins with oil in their lamps where the invitation during the tribulation period goes out it's gone out it started with the two witnesses it carried on into the 144,000 the gospel of the kingdom was spread around the world during that tribulation tribulation period and those who were had ears to hear who were God's who, for those for whom Christ died, all his people, we can be assured that they will hear and they will respond to that gospel. And those are the wise virgins with oil in their lamps. The ones who were not watching, who were not worthy, who, were, who did not enter in. The foolish virgins are those who, who reject who will reject the gospel of the kingdom during this period and will not enter in to the kingdom, period. That's what the text is saying. It's not a passage, the parable of the ten virgins. It is not, 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 not a passage that refers to, that is talking about the church today or that some Christians have oil in their lamps and some don't. And my, my goodness, you've got to have oil in your lamp or you're not going to be raptured. Uh, you know, if you don't have oil in your lamp, you'll be left behind. That is a misinterpretation of that passage. Do not be deceived. Because now we have merit that has slipped in to the whole subject of the rapture, where that the rapture itself becomes based upon merit. Where that if that were true, then the body of Christ would be divided, it'd be dismembered, and part of the body would be left behind, and that is not the case. Now then comes the difficult part for me. I, I've 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 slept on this. I, I I've fretted kind of over this all day yesterday. Every everywhere I stepped, everywhere I went, everything I did, I I just just it wouldn't 
I couldn't put this, set this aside from my thoughts. I had to make a decision as to whether or not I was even going to introduce this possibility, this concept, this theory, this viewpoint at all in this video. And I decided, why not? I mean, I'm already kind of out there on a limb with most people anyway when it comes to my un unorthodox views. But I want to say right up front, this is not something that I just dreamed up. Okay. So I'm going to lay this out here for you folks to think about. It's just something you can think about. I'm not asking anybody to agree with me on anything. I never, never want you to do that ever. Okay. I kind of feel like the more that I, that, that do that I I give you to think about the more that you have more you have to draw your own conclusions to reach your own conclusions based upon your own research your own study your own diligent study I want you to imagine if you can every every lost soul in hell and I'm not talking about the lake of fire. I'm talking about in, in, uh, in Hades, in hell. Whoever lived, I want you to try to wrap your mind around the idea, the possibility that, and I know as crazy as this may sound, at least think about it. Imagine every lost soul in hell who ever lived raised at the end of the thousand years, the end of the thousand years, this is at the end of the thousand years when Satan is loosed after being bound for a thousand years and goes about to deceive the nations it is at the end of the thousand years that those who listen the dead in Christ not, not the dead in Christ the dead out of Christ the, the lost and the unsaved it is at the end of the thousand years that we see the great white throne judgment. Okay? What's interesting about this, well, there's a lot of interesting things about this, and it really begins with Gog and Magog and how the terms are used and how the figurative terms uh, Gog and Magog describe, at least it, they, they did in the Jewish mind, all of God's enemies, all, everywhere, at any time. Get Russia out of your head for just a moment, okay? Just just for a moment. This great white throne judgment, of which we will not be a part of, I don't see any indication in the text that we are a part of that. This occurs at the end of the thousand years. We just got through reading in... in Chapter 20, that the, the rest of the dead live not again until the end of the thousand years. Okay. And in our minds, we've all, always sort of, well, at least most of us uh, Christians who have spent some time in, in looking at all of these things to come, uh, maybe spent years of you know trying to develop some sort of cohesive, consistent theology out of all of this es catalogical revelation we've we've decided that well at the end of the thousand years well they slept through that thousand years or, or they were in 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 the in in hades during that thousand years and at the end of the thousand years when it's all over they're raised to the great white throne judgment they're raised at that time to stand before god and be judged and condemned forever to the lake of fire. But it's immediate. It's immediate. They're raised, and as soon as they're raised, they're, there's God, they're standing before God, just like that, that fast. As soon as they're raised, there they are, before God. Maybe that's not the case. I'm going to suggest maybe that's not the case. I want you to imagine that for just a moment, every single lost soul 
who er, in hell who ever lived. Being raised at the end of the thousand years. Not to immediately stand before God at the great white throne judgment, even though they will. Okay. But raised. And they are spread abroad the whole earth to war against Christ and the saints. Christ who's ruled for a thousand years and, and the saints that are alive at the end of the thousand years who haven't died and gone into glorified bodies, but who are alive wherever they happen to be camped. We're looking at, this is the true, I mean, what you would call, I, I don't know, it's a, a horrifying scenario, I mean, to say the least. Okay. Could it be true? Now, of course, Satan goes around to deceive the nations. So there will be nations at that time. There will be people alive at that time. There will be people who are deceived by Satan. But, but, could it not in include every lost soul in hell who ever lived? Everyone's raised to life, back to life. Everyone is raised, okay, to either live forever with the Lord or be separated from the Lord for all eternity. But everybody's raised. I don't care who you are, whether you're a believer or non-believer, everyone gets raised. The interesting thing about this is that in the passage concerning the great white throne judgments, there's no mention of resurrection. Okay. Uh, One of my friends mentioned, well, Steve, yeah, well, there's, it's, it's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. That's, I've pointed out before, uh, uh, that is a passage that I believe refers to our having died in Adam. It's appointed unto men once to die, that is in Adam, and then the judgment. It refers to our death in Adam. Lazarus died twice. But why does the text not say Christ and the saints destroy them as Christ did at the second coming? He certainly has the power to do so. Why fire by God from heaven? It could be because they are the dead that hell gave up. Which explains why death and hell are only then cast into the lake of fire. Now they, God has no more use for death. He has no more use for hell. But until then, they serve a purpose. This is evil's last ditch effort to avoid judgment. There's no, there's no resurrection mentioned in the great white throne passage. Why? Because pro it could be because the, they were already raised when Satan was loosed. Now, I mean, don't get the wrong pictures. I don't think we're, you know we're looking at a bunch of zombies running around. Every single person who was ever raised from the dead looked normal. I mean, to most, you know, they might might not have been immediately recognizable, but they weren't. And I understand that these are lost souls, but. This is Satan's, could be Satan's one last ditch effort to avoid the condemnation that's due him. And, and keep in mind that those in hell would never repent, even if given the opportunity. I don't believe for one moment that that's true. You see that in the rich man who only wanted relief from his his agonizing thirst. The native character, the true character of the human heart, dearly beloved. 
after death can't be changed. I mean, what is going to change it? The sin nature knows no remorse. Your old man doesn't like you, the new man, very much, okay? He has no sympathy. One has no sympathy for the other. One has no love affair with the other. So I want to state for the record that there have been other scholars that, that have at least entertained the idea, thought about the idea, thrown the, this idea out there for people to consider. And I don't know if it's true or not, folks. I'm not going to tell you this, this, this is true. This, this is how this is. This, I'm not going to say that. I'm just giving this to you for you to, for you to think about. There was... Uh, I, uh, I'm in the habit of going through most of the commentaries and looking at, at especially a, a tough passage. I want to I wanna be able to see what these commentators' opinions were on certain passages. Uh, these are good and godly men who have uh, gone before us that the Lord has used mightily as it's uh, God's gift to us. In fact, it's... But one of them, his, I'm going to talk about John Gill. John Gill was, uh, he was born in uh, 1697. You know, he lived for 74 years. He was an English Baptist pastor, uh, biblical scholar. Uh, he was a theologian who held firmly to many of the truths that you'll hear on this channel. As far as the, uh, as uh, the subject of soteriology goes and, and uh, new birth and salvation. He was born in England. He, uh, he, he mastered the Latin classics and he learned Greek by age 11. Uh, but I haven't done that. I didn't do that. Of course, I'll stop right here and I'll say to all of you, you know, you, we can know all the Greek in the world and go straight to hell. Okay. But I do believe that there is some value to giving notice to certain theologians' credentials. He continued uh, his self-study you know, in everything from logic to Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew remained his special love throughout the rest of his life. He was awarded the honor, honorary degree of Doctor of Divinity by the University of Aberdeen. He was a profound scholar, and he was also a prolific author. He, he, uh, Gill's expository uh, commentary, uh, as well as uh, a lot of other numerous works, uh, he loved the Lord. He loved God's Word. And... If you read his commentary on this passage, I'm going to read part of it. I'll just go ahead and read part of it. And shall go out of his prison, the bottomless pit, that's Satan, and shall walk to and fro in the earth and go about like a deceitful serpent and roaring lion as before deceive the nations to deceive the nations. As he had done before the thousand years began and from which he was restrained during that time, which are in the four quarters of the earth, all the world over, the names of which nations are Gog and Magog, not the same which are mentioned in Ezekiel. Though there is an allusion to them, and from thence the names are taken, and some of the figures borrowed, and design the enemies of God's people who will be in the world at this time. So the Jews speak of a Gog and a Magog that will come up against Jerusalem in the days of the Messiah, whom they still expect, by whom they shall be destroyed to gather them together to battle, not one against another, as some think. As the Pope against the Turk, 
and the Turk against the Pope, nor are they designed at all, nor to kill them as the Ethiopic version renders it, but against the saints and people of God in the beloved city and camp, herein will lie his deception of them, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea that is innumerable in allusion to Gog and Magog. In Ezekiel chapter 38. But the great question is, who are meant by these? Who are meant by these? He goes on and says, not the papists, the nations made drunk with the wine of Rome's fornication, the Gentiles by whom the holy city is trodden underfoot, and who will be who will be angry when the time of avenging the saints has come. For these will all be destroyed, even all the remains of them at the battle of Armageddon. Nor is Antichrist himself intended, who will be destroyed in the spiritual reign of Christ with the breath of his mouth and at the above decisive battle, the, the battle of Armageddon when Christ returns. The beast and the false prophet will be taken alive and cast into the lake of fire. Nor are the Turks designed, the people of Magog being Scythians originally, as Josephus says, from whence the Turks sprung, or uh, Tartarans, uh, the countries of Gog and Magog, uh, uh, some think that these are the same, with the four angels bound at the river Euphrates and loosed, whose armies are represented as exceeding numerous. But though the Turkish dominions are very large, yet they do not extend to the four corners of the world. And when the Turks were let loose and came into Europe, it was not against the true Christians, the camp of the saints. The beloved city is here, but against the anti-Christian party, the, the papists have suffered most by the incursions of the Turks, though it has not brought them to repentance. Besides the loosing of the four angels or the Turkish nations, and their chiefs is long before these thousand years begin that is passed already under the sixth trumpet, whereas the seventh trumpet will be blown and all the seven vials poured out and the world cleared of all Christ's enemies. And after that, a thousand years must run out before this Gog and Magog army will appear. Nor are the Americans the nations here spoken of, for they are but in one quarter of the world. I'm I'm really en enjoying reading that uh, for some reason. Not the Americans. Uh, he goes on to say Some think that the wicked living in the distant parts of the world in the corners of the earth are meant, who upon Christ's coming will flee and remain in continual dread and terror to the end of a thousand years. When Satan will gather them together and spirit them up again. So it's really the outlying nations, those furthest away from Jerusalem. That's Gog and Magog. They haven't been quite so influenced by Jerusalem, the holy city, during the kingdom period because they haven't lived so near Israel they're the outliers you know the out you know so that's who Gog and Magog is uh, but this cannot be because they will all be destroyed at the universal conflagration of the world nor will there be any in the new earth but righteous persons but these will be all the wicked dead the rest of the dead who live not again until a thousand years are ended when uh, will be the second resurrection the resurrection of all the wicked that have been from the beginning of the world and these with under the direction of of satan will make up the gog and magog army all the the characters agree with them uh, these may be called nations or Gentiles being aliens from the true Israel of God, the dogs that will 
be without the holy city, these may be said to be in the four quarters of the of the world, since where they die and are buried, there they will rise and stand upon their feet. An exceeding great army. And as they will die, enemies to Christ and his people, they will rise such as they will go down to hell with their weapons of war, as is said of Meshach and Tubal, the people of Gog, they will rise with the same. The grave, the dust of the earth, will make no change in their vile bodies. Nor the flames of hell, any alteration in the disposition of their minds. Yea, as is said in the above Place. They will lay their swords under their heads and so be in a readiness when they rise to make use of them against the saints and to avenge themselves for their envy, malice, and revenge will be heightened and increased by their confinement and punishment in hell, nor need this be wondered at since the devils, notwithstanding they have been so long expelled and have been in chains of darkness and in expectation of everlasting torment, retain the same enmity as ever, and though the deception will be very great to attack saints in an immortal state who are like the angels that die not, nor will these die any more, and especially since Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who rules the nations with a rod of iron, will be at the head of them, yet it need not seem strange when they will rise as weak and feeble and as little able to resist temptation and as much exposed to seduction as they were before. Satan will have as much power over them as ever and what with their own numbers and the posse of devils at the head of them and especially considering the desperateness of their state. and that this is their last struggle and effort for liberty. They will animate themselves and one another to this strange undertaking. These now may be called Gog and Magog, as the one signifies covered, the other open or uncovered, these being all the enemies of Christ and his people, both secret and open, and this sense well accounts for their number, being as the sand of the sea, and which and which the Arabic version seems to confirm. The Jews have a notion that this deception of Satan will be at the day of judgment, which agrees with this account, for immediately upon this will follow the judgment of the wicked. I gotta, I gotta tell you, when I went through chapter 20, reading up to the great white throne judgment, where Satan is, is cast into the lake of fire at the end of the thousand years, and then which immediately follows the uh, final judgment the great white throne judgment. When I, just a careful reading, it left me with several unanswered questions as to how, well, I'll just tell you, in, in all my years of Bible study, I never even considered the idea that those whom God raised at the end of the thousand years to stand before him at the great white throne judgment, I never even gave it a thought that all of, all of this massive number of souls could be the great multitude that, that numbers as the sand of the sea shore, that that is the Gog and Magog that comes against Christ and his people at the end of the thousand years as a one last ditch effort. It's all of the raised, unsaved, 
in one final grand conflict in that battle between good and evil, between God and Satan. Is that is it possible? I suppose it is. Does it make any difference? Really? Okay? As far as we're concerned. That's another question I suppose we could ask. I don't know just how much it, you know, uh, taking, assuming one position or the other, how that would affect our day-to-day, -day, ordinary day-to-day -day lives and our walk in Christ, the God who is so wonderful and so gracious to us, who died in our place, who died so that we might have life and that more abundant. I suppose we could say, or I could say, that it does that. Things like this tend to spur our our imagination. You know, our increase our interest, perhaps at least hopefully, in looking deeper into His Word and spending more time in it, because we go to it to spend time with him look I love you all I truly do I hope you all are fine and well I pray for you constantly please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry I'm feeling much better after the medication that they gave me I believe on my way to, I'm on my way to, to full recovery I've got some other underlying health issues that are not all so much as, as much important but uh, we all do we all have our circumstances the Lord takes us through in life just know that, that you're on my mind constantly I love and appreciate all your comments all your love all your messages all your support until next time this is Steve thanks for watching